Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And um, in some ways, I guess I'm playing off of um, a, uh, a recent love that I've had in looking at the minor prophets, or what we call the minor prophets. And um, those of you who were here the last time I preached know that I preached from uh, Habakkuk. Um, and this morning, I'd like to look at the prophet Hosea. So you can turn with me to Hosea chapter 2. In just a minute here, I'll be reading from a few verses there. I've entitled my sermon this morning, Baali or Ishi, and we'll get to that in just a bit. Um, those of you who aren't using the King James Version uh, may not recognize it when we come across it, um, but um, it is. these are words used in our Bible, and uh, we'll get a, a better understanding of what that means in just a bit. So the book of Hosea and my sermon this morning is primarily about who God is. Now, when we think about who God is, it may sound like um, may sound like something that's designed to only be informative um, about know who God, know about God. But knowing God is a, an actual growing experiencing of God. And actually the Hebrew word for know does give that implication already. To know God is to experience God, to have a, a, a deep uh, growing relationship with God. And I hope to this morning demonstrate how this character and nature of God is actually something that that motivates, it galvanizes us and requires action from us. It affects how we view God and how we act toward God. Furthermore, it affects or it helps us to understand the world around us. So if Jesus had told the story of Hosea, it would likely have fit with his parables about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son. Because the story of Hosea is the story of a man pursuing, forgiving, and redeeming a prodigal wife. As God intended, this story demonstrates how he responds to Israel. Despite their abandonment, despite their betrayal of him, and despite their um, rejection of his marriage covenant with them. So we'll look at Hosea chapter 2. I'll be starting to read here in verse 14. Hosea 2, 14, and I'll read through the end of the chapter. Would you stand with me as I read? And I'll be reading from the King James um, this morning. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and, sh and shalt call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Baalim out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. You may be seated. Hosea's message, as we look at it this morning, will be expressed primarily through the names of his children, through the names for God, and through Hosea's actions regarding his marriage. 
Hosea's message is a message of hope, of redemption, of restoration, a recognition of sin and godly, godlessness and the consequences that may follow will be there. We'll, we'll see that. And uh, if we read um, throughout the rest of Hosea, we'll see that even more. But the pursuit by God of his people is the overall theme. A desire to invigorate and instigate a new kind of relationship that moves beyond a master and servant relationship to a husband and wife relationship. That's what God is pursuing. So the book of Hosea is 14 chapters long. We'll be looking primarily at the first three chapters this morning. The last 11 chapters are a compilation of prophecies and poems, um, and some think probably extended over 20, 25 years of Hosea's life. Um, the last 11 chapters give a lot of judgment, a lot of what's going to happen to Israel. Now, chapters 1 through 3 give us a peek into that. Chapter 1 and chapter 3 talk a lot about how Hosea lives out what he's told to do, lives out in action uh, through his marriage and through his children. Uh, chapter 2 kind of crafts the message that we hear echoed throughout the rest of Hosea. And it's the message for Israel, and it's the message for us today as well, I believe. So who was this Hosea? Now, Hosea was uh, an 8th century prophet, which means uh, he comes before many of the other prophets that we have uh, in our scriptures. His time was before the Assyrian exile of Israel. So that means he is before any of the exiles. And he is speaking primarily to those northern tribes. He uses the name Ephraim in, when he's referring, or some of the time when he's referring to Israel um, and those tribes. Um, and he does allude to Judah a few times. We may actually get to a point where he talks about that. His name, Hosea, means salvation or he saves. And I believe this is a picture, this is the picture that Hosea portrays of God. It is a picture of one who saves. Now as we look at chapter 1, we see that Hosea is told to take a wife, take a wife of whoredoms or harlotry, a wife who will be unfaithful to him. And in this, he gives us a picture of what God did with his people Israel. His people Israel strayed from their covenant with God. And they sought other gods quite quickly, actually, after um, their initial covenant with God there in the wilderness. And they continued to do that throughout their time, even in the promised land to go after Baal and Asherah. In verse 4, we arrive at Hosea's children. Now, there are three children listed for us here in verses 4 through, uh, four through 9, at least here. And the first child's name is Jezreel. Now, I'm just going to read uh, briefly here in verse 4 and 5. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with what happened in Jezreel. Um, but the name Jezreel itself is basically what God is calling Israel now. God had given them a name. He had given them the name Israel, which means uh, prince of God, Israel. And now he's calling them Jezreel. Jezreel means scattered by God. Um, actually, it's also pronounced Yisrael. Uh, a very, very similar pronunciation there, um, and, and maybe an allusion perhaps but he is calling his people 
scattered. And the reason he uses the name Jezreel, as he talks about here, is because of the bloody punishment that was dealt out by Jehu in the valley of Jezreel. Now, Jehu is uh, the man who became king. He was um, told to take his, he was anointed, told to take the kingship, um, and he destroyed the house of Ahab, killed the sons, um, had Jezebel killed, um, and brought a lot of blood to the valley of Jezreel. Now, he was rewarded for that action. Um, in 2 Kings 10, verse 30, it says, And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab, according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So the wording here in um, verses 4 and 5 is, can be maybe a little confusing, and I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it. Some people um, think that... Um, or translations would, would hold that it's talking more about as Jehu punished the house of Ahab for idolatry, so God will punish Israel for their idolatry now um, instead of a revenge on Jehu um, for what he did at Jezreel. Nevertheless, the point is the same. Bloody punishment awaits. <clears throat> and that is why he was to call his name Jezreel. A second child is born, and that child is named Lo Ruhama. Lo Ruhama means I will not have mercy or I will not have pity. Something, somebody that is unpitied. Another image of, of how the children of Israel would feel. They would not feel the mercy of God as the Assyrians swept down into their land. And then the third child Loami, you are not my people. The people rejected God, and so God turned aside from them. They would feel, they would not feel like they were his people. These three names, sorry, I should be moving along here. These three names give a picture of punishment, a picture of rejection, a picture of exile from God. God had taken a wife at Mount Sinai and the children of Israel rejected him. Now verse 10 shifts and I, I really feel like verse 10 should be the start of the next chapter and actually the Hebrew text does do that. Verse 10 I'm going to read verse 10 through 2-1, uh, according to the King James. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Say ye unto your brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamah. Despite their rejection of God, God would gather and call them back, not just as his people, remember Ami, but as sons of God. Judah and Israel will be gathered together and they will appoint a leader and they shall come out from exile. For great shall be the day of Israel. Just as Jehu had brought about a day of reckoning, so the day of reckoning would come to them as well. But that day would be a door of hope and we'll get to that in just a bit. A door into a new kind of um, a new kind of relationship with God. When we take that word or that part "lo" out of the word out of the name "loami," it becomes "ami," which is "you are my people." And so, in uh, chapter two, verse one, say ye unto your brethren, "Ami." 
you are my people. And same with Ruhamah. I will have mercy. Now, verses 2 through 13, we could go into a lot of detail here. Um, Plead with your mother. She had sought out other lovers. Israel had sought out other gods, crediting them with her wealth, crediting them with uh, the sustenance that she received, that oil and wine that we talked about earlier, that, that abundance. They said, these are the gods that, that brought this to us. So God says, I'm going to take that away from you. I'm going to take away that abundance. And here we get a brief glimpse of, of some of the rest of the book. Punishment. Punishment because of Israel's choices. It was the result of what they had chosen. And then in verse 14, we see the switch back. And I read, this is the portion that I read just a bit ago. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. Does anybody know what happened in the valley of Achor? It's not a nice scene. Somebody was stoned, yes. Valley of Achor is the place where Achan was punished. Now, how, does, how is that made into a door of hope? I think the NET calls it a door of opportunity. Well, it is that punishment that allowed the taking of the promised land to happen. It was, it was Achan's sin that kept them from, from conquering Ai and the rest of the promised land. And so that punishment created a door a door of opportunity for the rest, uh, for, the, for the children of Israel to enter the land. I believe it's also a picture of God saying, this is actually the punishment you also deserve. You have rejected me just like Achan did. You have taken unto yourself what's best for you, not, not doing what's best for God. So instead of a death like you deserve, I will give you forgiveness and I will give you a way forward. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi and shalt call me no more Baali. The word Baali means master. The word Ishi means husband. God is saying, you will no longer call me master, but you will call me your husband. So what is that difference? Now, I, I realize the word Baali and the, the similarities to the word Baal and the gods that they were serving, and I think there's some, there's some reason for some of that. Um, and I do think that on one level, God is... is giving them a message about idolatry to Baal versus um, a commitment to God, their husband. But ultimately, I believe this is a picture of God telling his people that I am the reason for your hope. I am the reason for your redemption and your restoration. I'm not a master bringing punishment on you. I am a God. I am a husband pursuing you. And I think this becomes evident as we look at the passage surrounding um, this verse, verse 16. Because up until this point here in chapter 2, God has been laying out the, character, the characteristics of what a master looks like. A master is someone, and, and he does this in reference to the master that Gomer, uh, Hosea's wife, was serving. A master is someone who punishes severely. When there is failure, when there is a mistake, there is punishment, and there is severe punishment. A master has no mercy. And a master rejects and disowns failing servants. 
if you're not able to live up to the expectations, then the master moves on. A husband, on the other hand, and this comes out pretty clearly in in verse uh, 19, a husband does the opposite. A husband is one who forgives. A husband is one who has developed a relationship, and therefore when there are mistakes, when there are when there is failure, there is forgiveness. A husband responds with loving kindness and mercy. Just listen to verse 19. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. A husband never gives up on his betrothed. The children of Israel were in breach of their covenant. They had failed at the covenant that was made. And yet, instead of rejecting them, God came back and said, I will again betroth thee to me. I will again take you as a wife. This characterization then, this characterization of God, feeds into how the names of Hosea's children are characterized in verse 23. This is the chart we had done earlier, uh, looking at what the, what the names symbolized. Now let's look at verse 23. And I will sow her unto me in the earth. Now, I said briefly that the name Jezreel means scattered. But there's a, there's a sense to the word that it actually also means sown or planted. And if, if you think about uh, a farmer going into a field and scattering seed, That's the idea of Jezreel, sowing. And so in verse 23, and I will sow her unto me in the earth. Hosea is making a call back to this name, Jezreel, and saying, yes, there is bloody punishment. Yes, you will be scattered, but ultimately you are sown unto me in the earth. And I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. Instead of no mercy, or unpitied, now we have obtaining mercy, Ruhama. And then we finish verse 23, and I will say to them which are not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. So we've turned the names, and, and now it means Uh, I'm sorry, let me just read this verse as it would be if we were using the names instead of instead of what um, instead of what they mean. It would be saying, I will Jezreel her unto me in the earth and I will Ruhama upon her that that was lo Ruhamana. And I will say to Loami, thou art Ami and they shall say thou art my God. Hosea here using or God, using those names again to come back around and say, you know what? You are my people. You will obtain mercy. Uh, Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And though you are scattered, God is saying, you are actually sown and you will bear fruit. God is not just about scattering and bloody punishment. He is planting a field. He is planting a garden. Contrary to how things may appear, he does have mercy on his people. And he has not abandoned or rejected them, but rather desires to call them back into a covenant relationship. Chapter 3, we see Hosea told to buy back his wife. And it gives this picture of Israel returning and again having a Davidic king. And we know that prophecy um, came to fulfillment in Jesus Christ, a Davidic king. Now, as we look at the rest of Hosea, there are sections. And I think the first section um, of prophecies and poems goes from about chapter 4 to, verse, to chapter 11. And then it ends with a, pro- with a promise of hope. And then it goes again 
um, 11, um, sorry, 12 to 14. And, and in 14, it has another image of hope. And so I'd like to read uh, just one of those images here in, in Hosea chapter 11. I'll just be reading this from the NET. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? I have had a change of heart. All my tender compassions are aroused. I cannot carry out my fierce anger. I cannot totally destroy Ephraim because I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. He will roar like a lion and they will follow the Lord when he roars. His children will come trembling from the west. They will return in fear and trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from Assyria, and I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. So what is the message that Hosea brings from God to Israel? The message that judgment is on its way is there. Assyria will bring destruction. The last 11 chapters make that abundantly clear. But perhaps it's, it's less about the punishment and judgment of God than we think. And rather it's God saying, even though you stray from me, yet I will pursue you and buy you back and redeem you. The punishment that you think you feel from God is not so much about God doing things to you as it is God not stopping those things resulting from your lifestyle and your choices. You will feel the scattering and bloodshed and punishment that Jehu brought to the idol-worshipping family of Ahab at Jezreel because you were all about worshipping Baal. You were all about building your nation. You showed no mercy, therefore you will feel unpitied and feel no mercy from God. You wanted to be your own people. You wanted to worship other gods. Have at it. This is the results. God's message is this. I will pursue you. Regardless of what you have done, regardless of, of what um, you have pursued, I will pursue you. I will plant you as seeds as my seeds in the earth. I will show you mercy again. Ruhama. And I will call you to be my children, the sons and daughters of a living God and Father. I am not your master. I am not Baali to bring you to me with fear of punishment, but rather I am your husband, Ishi, to love you to myself. Is that the God we serve? I don't want to downplay the role of servanthood because I think servanthood is, is vitally important. But servanthood needs to be about serving God out of love and commitment, not out of fear of punishment. And so that's what I'm trying to draw a picture of here this morning. In Hosea chapter 14, I'll be reading verses 4 to 8. This is right at the end. I will hear, I'm sorry, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. For my anger will turn away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. He will send down his roots like a cedar of Lebanon. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. People will reside again in his shade. They will plant and harvest grain in abundance. They will blossom like a vine, and his fame will be like the wine from Lebanon. O oh, Ephraim, I do not want to have anything to do with idols anymore. I will answer him and care for him. I am like a luxuriant cypress tree. Your fruitfulness comes from me. That idea of a luxuriant cypress tree bearing fruit gives the picture of of what Israel was called to in the first place they were called to bless all nations they were called God said through you I will bless the nations and it's that fruitfulness it's that luxuriant um, greenness that we 
are to benefit from as Gentiles and as um, the next generations. So what is the message to us? The message to us is that God is pursuing us. Even when it doesn't feel that way. He is seeking a loving, committed, betrothal relationship with us. He's not looking for an impersonal, demanding, punishing, master-servant relationship. He wants that committed, betrothal relationship. He wants us to do his will out of a deep love to please him. Not out of, uh, not out of fear of his judgment. He wants us to obtain mercy by demonstrating mercy. And also by boldly seeking mercy through repentance and intercession. And lastly, he wants us to call him our God and he will call us his sons and daughters I feel like Peter when he was writing his epistle had probably just gotten done memorizing this passage or had gotten gotten done reading this passage again or maybe he gave a sermon on Hosea because as I read 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, I hear this same theme. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And Peter here is actually talking about Gentiles. He's talking about how Gentiles, Christians, Gentile believers are now the chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, to show forth the praises of God. They were not a people, but now they are a people. They are the people of God. They had not obtained mercy, but now they have obtained mercy. Praise God. Then I will plant her as my own in the land. I will have pity on no pity. I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he will say, you are my God. Let's kneel for prayer.